In this video, I'm going to look at elimination reactions and halogenoalkanes. Now, in order for a halogenoalkane to undergo elimination, we need a base. A good example of a base is our hydroxide ion. It can behave as a base because it's able to accept a proton. That's the basic definition of a base. So it can use its lone pair of electrons to make a dative covalent bond to a proton or a hydrogen ion. And of course, in this particular example, we would end up with water. However, we might notice that the characteristics of a good base are also the characteristics of a great nucleophile. Nucleophiles, they've got that lone pair of electrons which they can use to make a covalent bond with a positively charged or partially positive charged carbon atom. So, halogenoalkanes can undergo elimination when we have got our protagonist, we'll call him, behaving as a base, but they will undergo substitution reactions when that same protagonist is behaving as a nucleophile. So we're going to have a look at how we can manipulate the conditions of a reaction so that we have elimination rather than substitution reactions happening, or vice versa. As with substitution reactions, there are two different mechanisms for elimination reaction. We have got E2, where the 2 stands for bimolecular. So the rate of the reaction depends on both the concentration of the base, um, we'll just call that base, um, and also the concentration of the halogenoalkane. And we have E1 mechanism, where the 1 stands for unimolecular, in which case the rate of the reaction depends only on the concentration of their halogenoalkane. Now, we know that primary halogenoalkanes only react using the E2 mechanism, and it's slow. Primary halogenoalkanes would much rather substitute than eliminate. Secondary and tertiary halogenoalkanes react faster via the E2 mechanism, and also via the E1 mechanism. This is particularly favoured by tertiary halogenoalkanes. So let's have a look at these two mechanisms. Okay, starting with the E2 mechanism. I've got here an example of a primary halogenoalkane because the halogen is bonded to a carbon that's bonded to only one alkyl group. And our alkyl group in this case is here, CH2, CH3. The carbon that the halogen is bonded to is often known as the alpha carbon. And the next carbon along on the chain is the beta carbon, and this is important. Our base, and I'm going to work with the hydroxide ion in this example, attacks a hydrogen atom on the beta carbon. Electrons from that carbon-hydrogen bond move to the carbon-carbon, and the carbon-bromine bond breaks, so electrons move from that bond onto the bromine. Note how careful I am in drawing my arrows, so I know exactly where my pairs of electrons come from and where they're going. Now, in this mechanism, we have a very short-lived intermediate state in which we have partial bonds between the hydroxide, the hydrogen, the carbons, and the bromine. And the negative charge is essentially spread over the molecule from the oxygen to the bromine. So let me remind you that these dashed lines indicate partial bonds. So the hydroxide ion is going to take the hydrogen away, the proton away. This carbon bromine bond is going to break, and we are going to end up with an alkene. So elimination reactions and halogenoalkanes give us an alkene. And obviously we're also going to have water in this example, and our bromide ion 
which has been kicked out or left, whichever way you'd like to look at it. If I were asked to draw the elimination reaction in an exam, then obviously I don't need to draw it in 3D. I just think when I'm starting to go through this, it makes it clearer. It certainly does for me. So in an exam, we could simplify this. We've got our methyl group, so essentially this three carbons, and I've got my hydrogen, hydrogen, and bromine. I could show my hydroxide ion. Remember that is attacking the hydrogen on the beta carbon. We've got electrons moving to between the alpha and beta carbon and the carbon bromine bond leaving. Um, I would then have an intermediate state, short lived. So we've got our CH3, we've got our carbon hydrogen, hydrogen, hydroxide, we've got a bond to the carbon plus a partial bond, hydrogen, hydrogen, bromine, and we need to remember to show our partial charges so we could show the negative charge spread out over our molecule. And then we're going to finish off with our products. So we have the double bond that forms between the alpha and the beta carbon. So where should I draw that? Well, we're going to end up essentially just with our products as drawn there because our alkene is obviously planar, which makes it very nice and straightforward. Let's contrast that with the E1 mechanism. So this is unimolecular. The rate of the reaction depends only on the concentration of the halogen or alkane. So in this particular example, we can label our carbons alpha and beta. The first step involves the breaking of the carbon bromine bond. As a result, we end up with a carbocation intermediate. So our alpha carbon is now only making three bonds. So that is positively charged. At this point, our base, in this case, we'll work with the hydroxide ion, comes in and steals or attacks the hydrogen on the beta carbon. And the electrons from that carbon hydrogen bond move to between the two carbon atoms. That's our alpha and that's our beta carbon atom. Our hydroxide ion is going to take that proton away, and we're going to end up with our product. So we're back to our alkene, obviously, plus water, plus the bromide ion. Now, the more stable this intermediate carbocation is, the faster the rate of the reaction in this particular mechanism. And the easiest way to stabilize a carbocation is to replace these hydrogens with alkyl groups. So let's replace them with methyl groups, for example, because alkyl groups are electron donating. So electron density will be pushed towards this positive carbon atom, helping to stabilize the charge. As a result, the entire intermediate is more stable. And if we replace these hydrogens with alkyl groups, then what we've done is turn our primary halogen alkane into a tertiary halogen alkane. So tertiary halogen alkanes react fast and readily using the E1 mechanism. So how do we know whether our halogen alkane is under, going to undergo substitution or elimination reactions? Well, it depends on a number of factors, but generally speaking, if I've got a small, strong nucleophile, such as my hydroxide ion, then we're more likely to have a substitution reaction. Let's have a look at why this might be. Because in a substitution reaction relies on our hydroxide ion behaving as a nucleophile attacking 
this delta positive carbon atom in the molecule and then obviously the carbon bromine bond breaks if it's an SN2 or if we have got the SN1 reaction so uh, with a tertiary halogen alkane for example um, let's put our hydrogens in and our carbon uh, we've got a point where we have an intermediate carbocation where this carbon atom is positively charged and again if we've got a small strong nucleophile then we're more likely to get substitution reaction because it's easy for these attacks to happen the hydroxide ion can get into that um, partially positively or positively charged carbon and make that dative covalent bond if I change my nucleophile for um, let's say tert butoxide ion what on earth is that you ask well it looks like so uh, with three methyl groups bonded to this carbon so again this is the tert butoxide ion it can behave as both a nucleophile and a base it's got negatively charged oxygen it's got the lone pair of electrons but it's a much bulkier ion it's going to find it hard to sneak in and attack a delta positive carbon it's much easier for this particular ion for example let me just make myself a smidge more room much easier for this one to take um, or attack a hydrogen that is on uh, that should be a bromine shouldn't it on the beta carbon so much easier for this attack to happen just in terms of steric hindrance this iron is too big to get in and attack a delta positive carbon that's very unlikely to happen so large anions are better bases than they are nucleophiles it's the way to think about it secondly activation energy elimination reactions have a higher activation energy in substitution because in an elimination reaction we're breaking two bonds we're breaking this bond here between the hydrogen on the beta carbon and the carbon and we are breaking the bond between the carbon and the halogen so high temperatures will favor an elimination reaction over a substitution reaction and then the third thing that we can manipulate is our solvent if our solvent is water so for example I have got aqueous sodium hydroxide and I am reacting that with my halogen or alkane then I'm more likely to get substitution particularly if it's happening at room temperature if I want elimination reaction then I might go for sodium or potassium hydroxide let's go with potassium hydroxide in a solvent such as ethanol so if I were to reflux my halogen or alkane with potassium or hydroxide and ethanol to high temperature then I'm more likely to get an elimination reaction but just to finish as with a lot of organic reactions in chemistry it's not straightforward you can't say if I do X I will definitely end up with Y all we can do is manipulate our reactions to favor either elimination or substitution by going for primary secondary or tertiary halogen or alkanes choosing our base or nuclear file very carefully looking at our temperature and looking at our solvent there are notes and questions on halogen alkanes as a topic to a level over on the crunch chemistry website so crunchchemistry.co.uk you can head over there and there's a link in the blurb below if this has been useful then please hit the subscribe button and, and like us it makes a huge difference to a small channel like us Look forward to seeing you next time.